The following program is a Town of Colony television production of the William K. Sanford Town Library. Thanks for coming. I'd like to thank Paul for making the long trip from his place of work to come be with us. He's actually probably not there that much. But um, um, Paul's a really good friend to our library, but to all libraries. He's a big believer in libraries, and we're still big believers in newspapers here. So, um, One quick thing about the book. Um, Today is called Noon Author Talk. It really should be Noon Co-Author Talk, but Paul will explain what's in the book. And um, the reason the book came about, I don't know if you know this, if you, unless you read our thing here. Paul wrote an article about the death of his family dog, um, Daisy. And he wrote a follow-up column after that because he got such a big response. And, <clears throat> and this is what he wrote. I have written more than 7,000 articles for the Times Union over the past 30 years, some six million words, and nothing in my experience had drawn that kind of response from readers. So how many people here own dogs or pets? So pet, pets are very important to families and everything. So here's Paul Grandel. The book is called Great, uh, um, Great Dogs of Albany and Beyond. Thank you very much, Joe, and thanks for all of you uh, for coming today. I see some familiar faces and some old friends, and I want to thank my uh, colleague, our senior editor at the Times Union, Teresa Buckley. She's, uh, she's listed in the front of the book. She actually did a lot of the heavy lifting, to be honest, most of the heavy lifting. We, <laughs> yeah, we did carry him across uh, um, past the duck pond and everything. but. Um, we, we worked on it together, and a lot of other people, like everything at a newspaper, it's very collaborative. But Teresa, you know, read, edited, worked on every single word, every single story in here. And as Joe mentioned, uh, it really started with this, this column that I wrote about uh, having to put down our beloved black lab, Daisy. And uh, I'll talk about that. I'd invite some of you to share. I saw that many of you have dogs. But even if you don't have dogs now, I'm sure some of you had a childhood dog or there was a neighbor dog or somehow these dogs, and, and I know there's probably cat people out there. Um, <laughs> you, you might have just seen the poll we had in the paper a couple days ago. Overwhelmingly, dog people won. Because we always hear when we, we've done a few of these books, and, and I'll talk about they benefit the Times Union Hope Fund, which is uh, our fundraising, our charity at the Times Union. It brings. Uh, probably seventy five to eighty thousand dollars everything that comes in goes out every year there's no overhead everyone does it as a volunteer uh, Teresa Buckley is on the board and uh, it sends disadvantaged kids to summer camp and after school programs so every penny uh, of profit of these books goes into the Times Union Hope Fund I don't make a dime of this the newspaper doesn't Teresa doesn't nobody involved made any money it goes to a good cause so we've done a couple of these books we did a book on uh, Albany Rural Cemetery the history of Albany Rural Cemetery and uh, I immediately got calls from St. Agnes Cemetery, Oakwood Cemetery, Vale Cemetery. We did a book before that, Story of Albany, also to benefit the Hope Fund. It's like, when's the story of Schenectady coming out? This story. So I've, I've gotten lobbied by the cat people. So there may be a great cats of Albany and beyond coming up too. Who knows? Um, but uh, I'll, I'll read some of these, um, and I'll, I'll read this column about uh, our dog Daisy that sort of set this in motion, and then some of the variety of, of uh, responses. So I got hundreds of emails, and, and people were very kind. They want to you know, offer their condolences and sympathy because these, these pets become part of your family, and they knew that I was very sad. We love this dog. And uh, so they, they sort of offered condolences, but then they told me about their dog. And they often include pictures. And I said, these are beautiful human stories, you know, stories from the heart. So we saved them all. And uh, eventually, many of them 
dozens of them, 75 or so of them, made their way into the book. And then we also augmented with some, it was Teresa's idea actually, to get some kids to write about their dogs. And some of my favorite stories are in here, the fifth graders of Pine Bush Elementary School in Gilderland, which is near where I live, where my daughter went to school and got a teacher there to assign to his fifth graders uh, to write about their dogs, and I'll, I'll read uh, one or two of those today too, and, and so those are a lot of fun. So it, it ranges from dogs that are therapy dogs that help people with Alzheimer's or children with autism to dogs that were horribly abused and uh, injured and they were rescued by people to just, you know, silly, goofy mutts that are just good you know, house dogs and family dogs. But I'll, I'll start with the story about Daisy. And um, I find that uh, the print seems to get smaller in these books too, Teresa. I'm stubborn and I've resisted. I've had these for several years. I only wear them like, uh, you know, in dark restaurants where it's getting harder and harder to read the menu and things. But I find here, it's like, wow, this print looks really sharp now. <laughs> So uh, this is called uh, Saying Goodbye to Daisy, a Great Family Dog. I lifted Daisy, our 14-year-old black lab, from the back seat of the car. I placed her gently onto a brown blanket spread on the floor of the veterinarian's exam room. Caroline stroked Daisy's gray muzzle, which rested in her lap. It was a week after Caroline's 18th birthday, two weeks after her high school graduation, and less than two months before she left for college. Now another passage awaited, one we had dreaded for months. Daisy became incontinent, and her hind legs began to wobble and teeter like an old broken gate. With each fresh indignity, more of the spark went out of her brown eyes. Last week, those deep pools of soulfulness seemed to beseech us to let her go with dignity. She was 98 in dog years, and we had crossed a fine line between a desire to keep Daisy in our lives and to do what was humane for the dog. My wife Mary sat on a bench in the room and clutched Daisy's collar. I stretched out on the floor and spoke to Daisy in soothing voice and told her over and over what a great dog she was. I rubbed her ears and the velvety tips still felt puppy soft. There was a box of tissues and we each began to empty its contents. We'd given the puppy to Caroline as a surprise gift on her fourth birthday. Caroline's face radiated pure joy as a, black, a small black fuzzy ball of mischief scuffled behind her and licked her arm. I captured that moment in a photograph. She named her Daisy. This was several months after we had put down Jazz, our Black Lab mix, at 13. Few things can compare with a childhood shaped by the unconditional love of a dog. We wanted that bond for Caroline. Daisy was the first purebred I'd ever bought after adopting dogs from the pound. We got her from a breeder who worked with my wife. I took Caroline to play with the puppies on a pretext a few weeks before her birthday and she gravitated to Daisy, uh, the runt of the litter. I think she felt sorry for the timid little pup who got pushed around by her more aggressive siblings. Daisy came with an AKC certificate and a folder that included a family tree detailing her championship pedigree. I lost the paperwork, but the breeder had leveled with me. Daisy could never be a show dog because she had small white patches behind her front paws and other slight imperfections. She was a family pet who was never a champion in anything except this. The love she brought into our lives was world class. She deserves some kind of ribbon for her appetite. She's never finicky and ate the same brand of dry dog food her entire life. When she heard the nuggets hit her stainless steel bowl, she began to perform, perform what we call the dinner dance, a spinning, whirling, dervish motion in which all four paws lost contact with the ground. She could hoover a cup's worth in less than 30 seconds. Even in her final days, she did the dinner dance, a slow and creaky version with a single rotation before plowing into her food. She never left anything in the bowl. I left her in the garage once after we moved into our new house when Daisy was three years old and she chewed off long strips of drywall tape and joint compound. She never destroyed shoes we left around the house except for the plastic tips of shoelaces in my running sneakers. I caught her crunching those a few times like so many cashews. 
If I tried to scold her, she'd scamper around the house in a move we called the butt scooch. It resembled a Roadrunner cartoon and spawned her nickname, Crazy Daisy. Labs are known to love the water and their webbed feet make them strong swimmers, not Daisy. She was a wader who preferred to glumph in the shallows as she chewed clumps of pond grass. We tried several times to carry Daisy out into deep water to coax her into swimming in ponds, lakes, rivers, and the ocean. No go. She also had an aversion to stairs. She lived her entire life on the ground floor of our house. We tried many inducements, but none worked. She slept on a blanket on a love seat in the TV room and was content. Once we rented a motel room in Provincetown on Cape Cod for a long weekend because it allowed dogs. I did not realize the room was on the second floor until we arrived and the only access was an outdoor wooden stairway. I tried everything, but Daisy would not budge. I ended up carrying her 70 pounds, four legs locked at full extension up and down the stairs three times a day. She was usually sandy and wet from the beach. The guests gave us a wide berth. An obedience class early on had little effect, and our attempts at training became sporadic and half-hearted. Daisy was a jumper and a flopper. She jumped up on anyone who came to our house in an exuberant greeting. I could not break her of the habit until arthritis did so at age 10. On walks, when we passed another dog, she immediately flopped onto her back in a submissive, submissive posture. She did not possess an aggressive bone in her body. She even flopped for cats. <laughs> Daisy loved all creatures, great and small. But Daisy had champion traits. She was a pro at curling up at my feet as I wrote in my study, immovable for hours at a time. No dog was better to watch movies with because she never stirred. Each morning as I came downstairs, Daisy greeted me with a full body wag. I reciprocated with a bear hug. She groaned with pleasure. She brought out good traits in us like love and tolerance and gentleness. I thought of a magnet my parents have on their refrigerator. I aspire to be the person my dog thinks I am. We felt that way about Daisy. In the vet's office, the drugs did their work. Daisy slipped away silently and peacefully. Time seemed to stand still. We'd been there for an hour saying our long goodbyes. The tissue box was empty. I looked back one last time at the black mound on the brown blanket on the floor. We closed the door quietly behind us and carried out into the lengthening shadows the memory of a great dog, our beloved Daisy, a true champion in the things that mattered. And that's the story of Daisy. That's kind of what people responded to and, and uh, wanted to tell their stories. And there is, I think, something universal in, in the love of a pet. And, uh, you know, there's all kinds of breeds and, and everything described in this book. But the thing that comes through is this beautiful thing they give us. They don't ask for a lot in return, you know, um, but they give us this unconditional love. And, and there's many variations and versions of that. I'll, I'll read one by... Um, a former colleague of ours, uh, Donna LaQuarrie, uh, I like this one. Uh, Donna um, is married to Mark McGuire, who was a sports columnist, TV columnist, was at the Times Union for a long time. He's the uh, sports editor at the Daily Gazette now. And uh, Donna had written for the Times Union in years past. And, and here's her story about their dog named Maggie. It says, Maggie chews up everything in her path. First, Maggie ate the top of the upholstered heirloom footstool that was one of my late mother-in-law's cherished possessions. Then she ripped a hole in the leather cushion of my ancient club chair, of the ancient club chair that my husband sat in when he got in trouble as a teen. He sat there a lot, so you'd think he'd have more patience for our puppy's wayward behavior. Then she destroyed the Christmas Story leg lamp wire cord which was, thankfully, not plugged in. Maggie seems to zero in on the things my husband treasures, which is funny, considering he's the one who did not want a dog. Other things that have found their way into Maggie's mouth, ancient nails that she clawed up from between floorboards in her old house, the insole of an L.L. Bean boot, a Mac Air power cord, two sets of headphones, wayward bagels, and molding. 
Luckily, she didn't swallow anything bad before I got to her, and now our house is dog-proofed. She's the first dog we've had as a family, and despite her mischief, we're all pretty much head over heels, even my husband. Maggie's got her own space, her crate, and the laundry room, but she's become a constant companion. She sleeps with us when I give in to her cries. She curls up on the couch during movie night and hangs out in the yard on a tether while we garden. Maggie is what we used to call a mutt. Now we make up names for mixed breed dogs. She is a schnuggle, a combination of schnauzer, pug, and beagle. From different angles, she captures each of those breeds. Her fur or hair seems to be all schnauzer, and even though I'm allergic to dogs, I've experienced no reactions. She stands a foot high at the present time, except she tried to eat the measuring tape, so I'm not quite sure. <laughs> we think at nine months she's fully grown. She weighs maybe 12 pounds. Despite her small stature, she holds her own at the dog park, a tiny black blur whipping around the legs of the bigger dogs, sometimes stealing their balls and generally being a pest. It's hysterical. Maggie was technical a res technically a rescue dog. Her mother was brought in while pregnant with pups that were born here in a safe place. We had most of them at our house to make our choice. They clambered over us and ran around like crazy, tackling each other and us in the process. My youngest daughter got her wish for Maggie, and we agreed. Magnolia is her full name for the two front yard magnolia trees given to me for our first Mother's Days in this house uh, almost two decades ago. That was, there was some confusion at first. Male was written on the adoption papers, and when we investigated physically, I couldn't really figure it out. So we renamed her Louie for a bit, <laughs> until taking her back to the rescue place for verification. For the moment, the club chair is safe. The vintage footstool has been removed from the parlor, and I've started looking for upholsterers. As for the leg lamp, well, I suppose it will need to be rewired. As Maggie trains us in our new role as a dog family, the adjustments we've had to make are all about love. And that's by Donna LaQuarry. Um, anyone want to share about their current or former dog? Anyone have a funny story or uh, anything they feel like? Yes, Peter. Uh, my name is Peter Platt, and uh, my family used to run Platt's Bear in Platt's Place on Wolf Road. Yay! Bring it back! Back in the uh, early 50s, we used to have a great day, big great day, called Tiger. Next door to us was Pet Navilia, and he had a great name, or a uh, greyhound. And the Dot family, who had 10 children, five boys, five girls, had the St. Bernard. So in the summertime, they used to come up and hang in by the door where people would come out with ice cream cones. And if a little kid came out, <laughs> and, and his parent would come to the store and just hold his that little bit of a cone left and of course he gave him another one for free. The tiger was afraid of no one except my mother. And, and she, our uh, home was right next door to the, to the dairy at the time. And he would go upstairs, he loved to sleep on top of the bed where the kids slept. But if he heard my mother's footsteps coming on the sidewalk, he would get so scared, he would go down the stairs to fall down the stairs. <laughs> and if you ever saw a Great Dane when he finished falling, <laughs> and then there was another one. Oh, and my mother used to close up at night when she was home. At 9 o'clock, the store closed in the winter, and Tiger would go with her. And whoever was closing up would put a scoop of orange shirt on the ground, and the dog would. <laughs> and when it was time to put the key in the door, he would just pick up the car and go in the house and finish it off. <laughs> I, I wish I had... I wish you were in the book. <laughs> but I would recommend Peter and some others did a great book, uh, History and Memories of Wolf Road, when this was just a country lane and all farms. I know they have a copy here in the library. The library supported the project, and yeah. you should get it. It's a great, great history of what used to be on, on Wolf Road. Well, there's many more stories. But that That's great. Thank you.
we'll have to save it for edition two, or maybe you know we'll, we'll get a cat story out of you or something. Anyone else want to add a one of theirs? Because I've got some more of these to read. These are uh, here's one that I like from one of the, the kids. What I really like about the kids' writing is they're so free and goofy and. You know, they say the first thing that comes into their mind, and, and uh, they have a pretty f funny sense of humor. So this is by Aiden Clark, was a fifth grader. This was last year. This was, uh, we were working on this late last spring, and it came out uh, this summer. Um, so he'd be a sixth grader now. Uh, it's about, called Eddie, the Peculiar Dog. And instead of photographs, we had most people send photographs. They drew uh, pictures of their dog, and he's got a dog here of Eddie looking like a beaver and climbing this pole, which will become clear in a minute. Um, ever since my family adopted our terrier mutt, Eddie, he's had some peculiar behaviors. Eating wood chips and grass, which is common for a beaver, forces him to explode with vomit. It's nasty. Never leaving my mom's side as if he were a toddler and barking every time there's an animal on TV. He's even memorized the music of the commercials with pets, so he starts barking even before the animals are shown. <laughs> the point is, Ed's not your typical average everyday dog. Whenever he's hungry, he squints at us until he has our attention, and he lays his paw in the food bowl. When he needs to do his business, Ed barks and points to the door with his body. That's not all. Most people believe that dogs, despite, despise wearing clothes during the winter. Not Ed. He looks forward to the day he puts his sweater on and loathes the day it's taken off. One day, though, when he was tired of waiting, he put the sweater on himself. The sweater is very old and worn out, and I'm not looking forward to when we have to throw it in the garbage. Another thing about Ed is that he really dislikes to be caged. No one knows exactly what happened, just that Ed somehow bent the bars to his cage. When he was put in the kennel, the only thing separating him from the rest of the kennel was a fence that didn't reach the ceiling. So he climbed his way to freedom. Although he causes a lot of chaos and mayhem, my family and I love him anyway. And that's the story of Eddie the Peculiar Dog. Uh, here's one more that I give Teresa the credit for the headline. A love for stinky cheese and blonde women. How's that for a headline from it? It's by Dennis Meadows, and he lives in Del Mar. And again, like, like a lot of these stories, they've got a little bit of everything, which is kind of life. These dogs are, and pets are, are, you know, remind us so much of the ups and downs of life, and this story will bring that out. Scout was our first dog. My wife and I had not yet decided to get a dog when in May 2003, she returned from a pepper tree rescue adoption clinic with Scout. She went to the adoption clinic to get information. She returned with so much more. <laughs> Scout selected my wife and came to our Del Mar home for a two-week trial period. The trial period lasted more than 10 years. We welcomed Scout into our hearts and our home. He arrived as a striking yet scared two-year-old Husky Great Pyrenees Cocker Spaniel Mutt. He had the fluffy coat of a Great Pyrenees, the red and white color of a Husky, and the floppy ears of a Cocker Spaniel. He was smaller than that combination would suggest, never weighing more than 50 pounds. Scout was afraid of men, but he loved the ladies. His original family included three blonde girls, and he was always drawn to blondes. It was more than two weeks before Scout accepted me and let me pet him. As a young dog, Scout was full of energy. We chased each other in the backyard before and after work, we let him run off leash at Partridge Run Preserve, and there was the occasional jailbreak <clears throat> where he would be high-stepping it down our street, only to be lured back with the promise of cheese. He even had a brief stint running agility with my wife until physical limitations put an end to his agility career. 
After 10 years of marriage, my wife and I separated. We had three dogs, two purebred, athletic golden retrievers, and Scout. I kept Scout, the lovable oaf of a dog, and my wife kept the Goldens. Scout had long ceased to be my wife's dog and always preferred being an only dog. In June of 2013, Scout was diagnosed with cancer. A tumor had developed on his right front paw and the vet gave us two options, really only one. It was clear to both me and the vet that there would be no radiation, there would be no surgery. I would do nothing other than make Scout's remaining time comfortable and enjoyable. The next few months, Scout's health gradually declined, but his goofy grin and wagging tail remained constant. As he struggled to get into his favorite chair, I removed the feet so he could climb in on his own. When the deck stairs became a challenge, a dog agility A-frame became a makeshift ramp. The hardwood floors were covered in area rugs so Scout could make his way from room to room. By late December, Scout could no longer support himself and I knew it was time. Scout and I spent most of the weekend together. I slept on the living room floor with him. That Monday, my wife and I reunited to say goodbye to Scout. At 13, he was no longer young and scared, but he still loved the ladies. He had developed a taste for bacon, chicken, and stinky cheese. We said goodbye to Scout, knowing we had given him the best life, and he had given us so much more. That's the story of Scout. Pretty amazing how it, it, it goes through, uh, you know, the range of, of human condition. Just the two of them together, then split and, and divorce, and then come and reunite for the dog at the end of his life. I, that's a beautiful story. Anyone want to share one of their dog stories? Yes. When my extra sons, and when they were oh, eight and ten, my older son finally said, you keep promising a dog, <laughs> when are you going to do it? So we went to the, in January, a very snowy, cold January, dumb, we went to the main society and looked around at all these dogs, couldn't find one. I kind of had in my head I wanted a female, who knows. And this cage said male, so we kept ignoring this dog, and finally nothing else clicked, but this dog just kept looking at us, and we went over, got her out, the dog stood up, and I said, I'm no dummy, this is, this is a female. <laughs> and she chose us. So we took her home on a Sunday and had to go to work on Monday. Again, what were we thinking? And so we put up, I had one of those old-fashioned gates with the you know, child gates that were no longer used, but they came up like this. So we put her on the lower level of our house and put the gate at the bottom of the stairs and came home from work. And the dog now named Lucky, who was, by the way, a, a shepherd collie mix, was upstairs. We said, oh, OK. So the next day, I put the gate in the middle of the stairs and came home the next day, and the dog is upstairs. And I had this vision of coming home and finding my dog impaled. <laughs> so we decided that Lucky was going to be upstairs. And upstairs is where she lived a very long life. I won't go on any further, but she managed to eat the whole side off my brand new love seat. <laughs> she ate most of the side off of the books. She loved magic markers. They were very beautiful poop. <laughs> you know, um, there were many, many stories about Lucky, and, and uh, we had her for about 15 years before we lost her. She was the first of many dogs. But her going over these gates, and you never could figure out how she did it without knocking the gate over or hurting herself. And in the middle of the stairs, imagine, <laughs> she was about 70 pounds, so she had a big leap. She was a one-year-old, which I thought meant she was a grown-up. Again. Oh. <laughs> I've been much smarter ever since <laughs> Thanks for sharing the story of Lucky. Very good. It's funny, I've seen uh, some people have like nanny cams or, or computer cams and they'll, they'll do uh, time lapse or, or 
videos of their dogs, and you think dogs, they sleep all day, right? At least when I'm home with my dogs, they seem to sleep all day. But man, these dogs are smart. They can figure their way over, like Eddie climbing up, you know. Dogs can climb, figure their way under things, how to open doors, et cetera. They'll, they'll keep at it, you know, if, until they figure it out. Um, here's a story, uh, again, showing all the amazing things that the dogs can do. I'll read, uh, it's about a Rottweiler who uh, was a great caretaker for a woman at the end of her life. Um, I'll read that story. It's a short one. And also, uh, I should have said, um, the, the first 200 books uh, that we published and uh, were given to the uh, Hudson um, Mohawk Humane Society. So they made $5,000 as a fundraiser for them. And we were involved. Uh, Brad Shear, the executive director, wrote an introduction to the book. And, and we were involved with them, some early um, events and things. So the Mohawk Hudson Humane Society, which does great work in helping dogs get adopted and, and uh, sheltering dogs, were a, a beneficiary of this project as well. Uh, this story is called Susie the Rottweiler was mom's guardian. It's by Regina Rude, and she lives in Altamont. We've had and still have many amazing dogs in our lives, but Susie, our Rottweiler, was an example of unconditional love and protection. Rotties are known for their protective nature, but they are often perceived as vicious dogs because of that very nature. My mom's health was failing fast at 81 years old. It became clear that we needed to find a home where she would be safe and well cared for. She lived on Long Island and we lived upstate, so she asked if she could live with us. Family and friends were concerned because we owned a large Rottweiler along with two small Shelties. Before we moved mom in, we had our Rottie evaluated. It was determined that dogs like her needed a job. She was loving and gentle, but no one dared to enter our little farm while Susie was on duty. Mom moved in and the most amazing thing happened. Susie and Mom bonded. We expected that Mom would be lonely coming from a busy city life to our little hobby farm, but by bonding with our Susie, Mom found a friend who would love her unconditionally, and Susie found the job she needed. She would sit with mom for hours as mom stroked her velvety ears. She became mom's dog. Many healthcare professionals came and went during the two years mom was with us. Some wanted the dogs to be locked up and others understood that the animals were part of the family. We always acted on the side of caution to protect both the visitors and the dog's reputations, but one visiting nurse ordered that we keep that Rottweiler away from my mom. My mom and I told her that is not my mom who would be in danger. The danger would be for anyone who looks like they might hurt my mom. During my mom's last two weeks, she needed 24-hour care. We got an army cot so I could sleep in her bedroom to attend to her, but Susie had a different idea. She was sure that cot was for her, <laughs> and she would share it with me if I had to stay, and she made us laugh when we needed it most. When mom passed, Susie showed signs of depression. Luckily, dogs live in the here and now, and before you knew it, she was back to her old tricks of stealing tissues and snacks off the table. Susie passed just a year uh, just a year and a half after my mom. I imagine that mom is in heaven with Susie beside her. She's getting those heavenly velvet ears stroked. They were meant to be together. A beautiful picture of big Susie Rawell, a big giant head nuzzled on the shoulder of her mom sleeping. Um, but again, these dogs are, are amazing. Um, does everyone know about, there's a section I, I wrote in here too about history and historical dogs, like the dogs that lived in the governor's mansion with the governors and Oni the postal dog. Has anyone heard of that? Yeah. If, if you haven't, I'll, I'll read it. One of the most famous dogs, in addition to Nipper, I've got the story of Nipper in here, 28 feet tall, four ton dog on uh, 
the top of Arnoff uh, moving and storage building in Broadway, but the building's for sale. We don't have a buyer yet, but I talked to, to Mike Arnoff. He said, I love that dog. If the new owner doesn't want it, I'm taking it and, and moving it to our new location. Um, so hopefully Nipper will stay on Broadway downtown, but if not, he'll have a home somewhere else around here. It's probably, it is the biggest Nipper in the country. At one point, there were many dozens of Nippers as kind of roadside sculptures and attractions around the country. They were the uh, mascot of RCA, you know, my master's voice. Um, and uh, there's only a couple left. There's a smaller one in Baltimore that was refurbished and a few others, but Albany's Nipper is, is famous in, in books and songs and postcards. And, and this Oni is, is probably the second most famous dog. Oni the postal dog's epic story and his own stamp. He has his own postage stamp. No other dog in Albany history has a legend that transcends the fame of Oni, the plucky orphaned Irish terrier mix who was the city's beloved 19th century postal mascot. Immortalized in books, films, souvenir merchandise, and the National Postal Museum in Washington, D.C., the dog's visage appeared on a 44 cent forever stamp and commemorative postmark that was part of an official Oni Day in Albany in 2011. The Oni saga began in 1888 after the stray mutt curled up on a pile of mail bags and fell asleep. Postal workers adopted the orphan mongrel and let the dog ride atop mail in horse-drawn wagons from the post office two blocks to Union Station on Broadway. Soon his horizons expanded as Oni was allowed to ride mail trains. Before turning him loose, Albany postal clerks bought him a collar with a return address that read Oni, Post Office, Albany, New York. The genesis of the dog's name is uncertain. It might have been a variation of an Albany mail carrier named Owens who gave the dog special attention. Or Oni may have grown out of initial questioning at the post office. Who is your owner and who owns you? Known as the tramp mail dog, he was the subject of scores of 1890s newspaper articles. One claimed the scrawny mutt stood guard over a mail sack that had fallen from a wagon to protect its contents from thieves. The popular pooch made a guest appearance at the 1892 Republican National Convention in Buffalo, and a crowd of 300 turned out to meet him during an 1896 visit to Brattleboro, Vermont. Postal workers considered Oni a good luck charm in an era when the job was a dangerous one due to train derailments, explosions, and robberies. The trains the dog rode on managed to reach their destinations every time unscathed. Workers began attaching leather and metal baggage tags to Oni's collar to mark his travels. The shiny tokens became so numerous and heavy that in 1894, Postmaster General John Wanamaker presented Oni with a harness-like jacket that more evenly distributed the weight of his fame. The dog eventually logged more than 140,000 miles on the rails. In 1895, Oni was sent on an around-the-world sailing voyage as a goodwill ambassador. He traveled with a dog-sized suitcase, holding a blanket, his comb, and a brush. He was shipped under a special mail classification, registered dog package. By early 1897, Oni was old and failing. He'd gone blind in one eye, could only chew soft food, and turned ornery in retirement when he was confined to the Albany post office. In June of that year, Oni stowed away on a mail train bound for Toledo, Ohio. During an interview with a Toledo newspaper re reporter, the terrier lashed out and bit a postal worker. On June 11, 1897, Oni was shot and killed, probably by a U.S. Marshal, although nobody claimed responsibility for the deed. Postal clerks took up a collection and had Oni stuffed. The taxidermy was displayed at the Post Office Department's headquarters in Washington, D.C. In 1911, 1911, it was donated to the Smithsonian Institution's National Postal Museum, where Oni remains a popular attraction. The dog's tale is published in children's books, including A Lucky Dog, written in 2003 by Dirk Wales and illustrated by Diane Kenna. There's some great pictures here of Oni, 
historic photos of mail train and the uh, drawing of the stamp. And I've actually been to the National Postal Museum and I've seen Oni. He's getting a little threadbare, you know, he's a hundred year old taxidermy and he's a little tiny. I mean, he's like a one armed dog and you could see why he had to put all those, there's probably like weighs half as much as he does, all these badges on this little harness, but that's there too. But again, a great dog from Albany's history. Um, I'd be willing to hear any questions too, or anyone want to share some dog stories? And we do have books for sale. I know some of you already uh, uh, paid up with Teresa. The books are for sale for $25. Again, everything goes to the Times Union Hope Fund. Um, but I'd be happy to talk about anything or questions you have. Yes? Are you aware of um, a local author who wrote the book Sniffer Dogs, which is no. it's an amazing book. It talks about the jobs that dogs have for detecting drugs, right. explosives, or fire. You know how they're used um, for medical reasons no. or tracking and you know uh, endangered animals. Yeah. But the author is in Chatham. Oh, really? Right, called Sniffer Dogs. Sniffer I'll look that up. It's, it's a really fascinating book. I did. I did. Um, Add a, a story in here. I went over. There's a uh, a dog memorial to canine and service dogs who were either killed in the line of duty of police officers or died of old age. And it's um, at the on the grounds of the Mohawk Hudson Humane Society in Menanza. And there's a beautiful monument, and they have um, stones in the ground with the dog's name and the handler. And I, I met the uh, the person who organized and got it going is a retired uh, canine um, chief of the Albany Police Department, and he told stories of his dogs. I mean, dogs that, you know, took stabbings and shootings when on the job and things. And you know, the, these dogs are amazingly loyal, and especially ones who've been trained to do a certain job, like sniffing. You know, I always feel safer when. I mean, I was down in New York City with the Pope, and it was high security. And there were dogs all around, bomb sniffing dogs. Anytime I'm at a big political event with a, or a big, you know, figure, the bomb sniffing dogs come through the hotel and things. And you know, you see them at the airport, and and they do find things. You know, they do prevent bad things from happening. So that yeah, amazing dogs. Um, that's good. Sniffer dogs. Are, I'll look for that. Anyone else? Yes. One more story, is that okay? Yeah, absolutely. We're gonna we're definitely gonna have to do another volume here. We got the, the ice cream eating Great Dane. We got Lucky, the scaling, the mess. What do you got? That's tough to beat. Some, some uh, tough competition. Tom Lyons, I grew up in Waterville Lake and lived most of our lives here in Latham. We recently moved to London. But first, a story about my wife. Okay. Okay. <laughs> We've been going around the North East Post retired now, and uh, we sample a lot of sandwiches. And my wife, my wife loves uh, roast beef sandwiches. And naturally, I asked, well, how's the sandwich? And uh, not too often, but once in a while, she says, great. But then there's this clause, and it says, and she said, but not as good as plats. <laughs> ah, there we go. We already had a bring back plats. That's fantastic. I like that story. So the story is it's very similar to Daisy. We yep. had a uh, chocolate lab. Uh, I know she was the run because uh, the reader told me so, and she was the last puppy left there. There was no other. Uh, she was a wonderful dog. Well, I don't remember too much chewing going on. She didn't bark that much. She didn't bark, but she didn't bark a heck of a lot. I think she liked the UPS guy and the postman. <laughs> there, was, there was none of that charging to the door or any of that stuff going on. Um, she was with us for 13 years. And you know, raising two boys, now and then there's, you have to discipline. And once in a while, I would sort of be eyeball to eyeball with one of my sons, especially in high school. You know, trying to get a point across, he trying to get his point across. The voices would be raised a little bit. And then we'd look down, and there would be Hershey. The dog would get up and put herself right between us. And we to say, that's enough. And it was enough. We basically chilled out. That's um, great. But it's actually about two dogs. I mentioned Hershey was 13 years old. 
Uh, near the end, I would come home from work, we lived in a raised range. I come in the front door, and there's stairs going up to the kitchen. And one of the best things about dogs, everybody's experience is probably, is that when you come home from work, your dog goes ballistic. <laughs> well, over the years, you know, the dog calms down, calms down, and uh, near the end, uh, she had arthritis really bad and so forth. And, and basically, she would be closer and closer to the ground, if you will, the top, the top of the steps. And uh, near the end, her, her face would be over the top step, and she'd be laying down, she could not get up. But when I came into the door, her tail would boom, 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 boom. So the second part of the story, second dog, uh, real quick. We walked the bike trail quite a bit, Sue and I. And one day we walk the bike trail, and out of the woods comes a beetle. Well, we we had to be about five or six, seven years old, covered with burdock and skinny, and you know looked like it was a tough shape. So we took it home, but we were a little hesitant because her she was so old and, and not getting around that much. But we took her, took the beetle back anyway, cleaned it up, went to the papers, tried to find the owner. We weren't able to find the owner. But the beagle, because it was relatively young, younger than, than her, she would run around the house and couldn't you know, go across the lonely and couldn't keep up with the speed of going so fast. I came home from work one day, opened the front door, and I looked for uh, Hershey. Hershey was standing up, and her, hat, her tail was going like this. The young dog, brought Hershey back, and for the next six months, Hershey was her old self. Wow. A wonderful story. Yeah, yeah. Um, but actually, a wonderful story, we put a little melancholy at the end here, because um, the beagle itself, uh, after about six months, we noticed a little bit of blood tracing around, and the vet said that the beagle actually had a tumor, and that's probably why the beagle was rocked. That's probably why we call it the beagle. But the, the interaction between the two dogs and in the household, it was, it was just wonderful. So, so wonderful that I had to get up here to tell <laughs> Fantastic. I see Teresa, we're definitely thinking of a volume two. Cats and dogs, maybe. And, and we actually got another dog after Daisy. We went for a while, almost a year without a dog. And, and uh, But this is Lily. She's on the back cover. I tell a little story about her in here. She's a pit bull, a lab mix. Amazing dog. I mean, probably the greatest dog I've had and uh, uh, in a lot of different ways. But she loves to go on road trips. So our daughter, Caroline, who, you know, was date, got Daisy. Like, Daisy for her at four years old is now at Fordham at Lincoln Center in New York City. And I go, you want to go on a road trip, Lily? And she's like excited. So we go down, we spend the day walking around Central Park, and there's a great place called the Ballpark Cafe by the ball fields where they have dog bowls and dog bones, and they're very, you know, cool, and they invite dogs. So we, we always stop there for lunch, and then there's always other dogs. We meet these other dog people, and amazing New Yorkers tell their stories about their dogs. But... Uh, in the beginning, I, I write a little bit about the, the, uh, some of the statistics, and there's probably like 250,000 dogs in the capital region or more. I mean, it's, it's a big number. And when you're in New York City, that, that city of skyscrapers, and, and uh, it's amazing. I think there's a million dogs in New York City. And somehow, they make it work, you know? Every time we go there, we, we meet more dogs and things, and it's, it's very cool. So dogs, um, you know, can have a great life in the city, in the country, where, wherever. And uh, thank you for sharing your stories, and I'll stick around. And if you want to buy a book and have it signed, I welcome you. Thank you very much. Thank you.